All right, friends, welcome, welcome. We see you there and welcome to our YouTube friends. We have an exciting day for you and I'm so happy that you joined us despite all this beautiful San Francisco sunshine we have going on. And do want to let you know that this event will be available on YouTube for future viewing. Thank you, Rodessa, for allowing that to happen. And please do share it widely because this is gonna be such a great program. Um, we wanna thank you again for being here and being part of San Francisco Public Library community. This is part of our summer stride and we're rounding out summer stride, but it is not too late for you to sign up, to do your 20 hours reading and to collect your beautiful, iconic San Francisco Public Library tote bag with that wonderful art from artist Kehlani Juanita. And Summer Stride cannot happen without our friends at the San Francisco Public Library. All right, and we wanna welcome you to the unceded land on the ancestral home of the Ramuta Shaloni peoples who are the original inhabitants of San Francisco Peninsula. We recognize that the Ramuta Shaloni understand the interconnectedness of all things and have maintained harmony with nature for millennia. We honor the Ramuta Shaloni peoples for their enduring commitment to Warep, Mother Earth. As the indigenous protectors of this land and in accordance with their traditions, the Ramuta Shaloni have never ceded, lost, nor forgotten their responsibilities. as the caretakers of this place, as well as for all people who reside in the traditional territory. We recognize that we benefit from living and working on their traditional homeland. As uninvited guests, we affirm their sovereign rights as first peoples and wish to pay our respects to the ancestors, elders, and relatives of Ramitush community. We recognize to respectfully honor the Ramitush people, we must embrace and collaborate meaningfully to record indigenous knowledge and how we care for San Francisco and all its people. And that link that I shared in the chat box leads back to um, really great reading list and resource list of first person uh, resources, including Native Lands and Segorite Trust. And they're out of Oakland and doing amazing work. So check them out. Our reading campaign for July and August on the same page, we're celebrating the work of Jacqueline Woodson and her book, Red at the Bone. And our book club is tomorrow at 7 p.m. Join us, it's a fun group. All right, and that is all the announcements for today for the library. But again, thank you all for being here. And yeah, sign up for Summer Stride. And we are so excited today to have Rodessa Jones and Lisa L. Biggs, Dr. Lisa L. Biggs and Dr. Jones for um, teaching art for personal and social transformation. These are amazing humans, amazing women, and doing amazing work. So without further ado, Dr. Biggs, take it away. Thank you so much. Can, can you guys hear me all right? Yeah, okay. Um, I'm Lisa Biggs. I'm um, here on the unceded land of the Narragansett and the Wampanoag in Providence, Rhode Island. And it is really my honor uh, today to introduce uh, Rodessa Jones, who I know for many of you in San Francisco is a well-known figure um, in the arts community. But for those of you who do not know, Rodessa Jones is co-artistic director of the critically acclaimed performance company, Cultural Odyssey. She is an actress, a professor, singer, playwright, and the founder and director of the award-winning Medea Project, Theater for Incarcerated Women in the HIV Circle. Rodessa has been working at the forefront of human rights for incarcerated women nationally and internationally for over 30 years. She's the author of several publications and plays, including Big Butt Girls, Hard-Headed Women. And for those of you who may not have seen her on stage, you may recognize her as the voice of the animated character Lulu from the double, double Oscar winning uh, Pixar film, Soul. Rodessa's pathbreaking work has been widely recognized. As I said, she's currently a, a Pew Fellow. She's also the recipient of a Sue Generous Foundation Award, the Goldie Lifetime Achievement Award, and the San Francisco Foundation's Community Leadership Award for developing an intersection of art, politics, and social rehabilitation through theater. Her latest documentary project, This Ain't Your Mother's Theater Company, profiles how her method 
informs trauma-based healthcare today, including uh, work conducted at the UC San Francisco Medical School, which conducted research relating, uh, correlating Rodessa's work to improve health outcomes for women living with HIV. Um, and to learn more about her work, of course, you can visit her website at themedeaproject.org. And now Dr. Jones is gonna introduce me. <laughs> and then we're gonna get this baby started. <laughs> oh, unmute, unmute yourself. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Good afternoon, I repeat again. Thank you so much, Lisa, for that illustrious uh, offering. I love you a lot. I, I will talk about Dr. Biggs, but She's a dear, dear friend of mine and associate that I, I am just so blessed to have her in my circle in my life. Dr. Lisa L. Biggs is an actress, playwright, and performance studies scholar whose artistic work teaches and scholarship investigates the role of the arts and the performance and movements for social justice. She currently serves as the John Atwater and Diana Nelson, Assistant Professor of the Arts in the Department of Africana Studies, Rights and Reasons Theater at Brown University. She's also a very, very prolific uh, writer. Uh, her, she has been the author of several, seven plays, including Vigilant, Vigilante Artists, Blackbirds and Afterlife, and a, Detro a Detroit 67 project. Her current scholarship researches the impact of theater and dance programs for women incarcerated in the US and South Africa. And has been a published in Solo Black Woman, which she interviews me and writes about me in that book. Black Acting Methods, Theater Survey and Applied Theater, Women and the Criminal Justice System. Her creative work and scholarship has been supported by grants and fellowships from the Knight Foundation, DC Arts Council, National Endowment for the Arts, and the Ellen Stone Bellick Foundation, among others. Her forthcoming book, Beyond Incarceration, is under contract with Ohio State University Press. Hi, Lisa. I'm Hi, glad we're spending this Sunday afternoon together. <laughs> thank you for the uh, opportunity and the invitation, and thank you to the San Francisco Public Library and all yes. the sponsors who made this event possible. It's, it's um, um, we're going to spend about what, the next hour and a half, give or take, um, really just talking about Rodessa's work and inviting people to learn more from her. This is um, just a taste of her um, work, her approach to um, working with not only incarcerated women, but folks living with HIV. And um, as I think was mentioned early on in the program, or if it hasn't been, I'll say it now, she is initiating a new project, an opportunity for teaching artists to learn from her directly. So um, welcome, 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 uh, welcome, welcome. I, I thought maybe that we could begin just really quickly um, saying a little bit about, about South Africa and how, yes. we, how we met, right? I know often you're asked to talk about your work in the US and it is really important that people understand what that is and we will get deep into it in a second, but, um, Part of the reason that, um, oh, I, I'm, I mean, I've been a long time admirer of your, your work. I, as a, an undergrad, I learned about your work and then um, uh, found an opportunity to take a workshop with you out on the East Coast at the Omega Institute. But um, from that, that brief kind of interaction, um, yeah, I wound up following you to South Africa to study your work there. Mm. And, um, was just wondering, I mean, the, the first clip that we're gonna show is about some of that work, but uh, as kind of as a preview, can you talk a little bit about why South Africa was important as a place for you to work? Like, um, what, what does South Africa mean to you? Well, at, at first I, you know, I really believe in gifts from the goddess. I had not planned anything. I was performing uh, my piece deep in the night at NYU in New York and deep in the night was an exploration of um, HIV with women in lockdown. And uh, uh, during that uh, performance in the audience was Rajni Munsami, who has an organization in uh, Johannesburg, um, um, uh, Urban Arts. 
And she approached me uh, after my performance and she said, if I could arrange it, would you come to South Africa and do this work? Because the work just spoke to so many issues that they, they are still and we're having in South Africa, you know, HIV amongst, amongst women, amongst families, and also incarceration. And uh, I had said to Rajni, I'd love to come, but if I'm going to come, I want to be uh, able to work in the prisons in at least Johannesburg. And she said, well, we, we will arrange that. And once I, once I uh, said yes, I thought it was going to be a year or so before she would raise the money. And it was like four or five months later, she calls and says, I got the money. Uh, can you come now? <laughs> and uh, of course, uh, yes, you know, I had, I had never been to Africa. And then to go in this way, on this path, of, of my work, this uh, teaching art for personal and social transformation, and to be uh, performing my work on this. We, we were on a stage at the Market Theater. And- uh, Which people, if people don't know, that is one of the preeminent uh, theaters in South Africa, period. Yes. It's also historically a space in which during the apartheid room that regime, that period of, um, of white supremacist rule dating from the early 1900s until the fall of yes. apartheid with the election of Nelson Mandela in 1993, 1994. Um, that the market theater um, was a site, the site, the preeminent site for radical revolutionary theater making. People who refused to be limited by the uh, apartheid regime's demand of, of racial segregation. So, um, but you're, so you're there at the market theater doing it the was, work. It was, it was stunning. The audiences were stunning. Uh, just, you know, sometimes touring in America, you only can hope that the pre-press gets out and that there'll be people that will know you or social justice, social activism will be uh, prevalent in a neighborhood or community. But it was like the audience was just spilling over. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, uh, myself and my partner, E.G. Sakamore, we got to present, I think, three different performances. And... Uh, I did Deep in the Night, the one that Rajni had seen. And then I also did Big Butt Girls, Hard Headed Women, which was, which was my solo uh, piece into the world of um, a political theater. It was my way of, of saying, hey, look at me, look at me. Uh, this is, I have something to say, because I'd started to work in San Francisco in the jails. And then we did uh, uh, another piece about Black history, about um, it was really interesting. It was about uh, uh, Billy. It was about Bessie Smith and John Coltrane. And I can't even remember the name of it now, but the audiences were lovely and they were just so engaged. And I remember when I did uh, Deep in the Night, which was a really a uh, look at uh, myth and medicine and um, in interview. I interviewed women in jail in San Francisco about um, menopause. It started out about menopause and it ended up being so many women confessed that they were menopausal and HIV positive. And, uh, and, and they were saying how, uh, I, I was asking about, uh, you know, so, some insomnia and they were like, can you imagine having insomnia? You're in lockdown and you are, um, uh, uh, you're up at night and you are ill with HIV. And, but they gave up so much beautiful material. And I was having dreams about Lord Getty, uh, a mythical creature, I think out of Haitian mythology. Lord, Lord Getty was visiting me, I, go figure, during this whole time. And my hairdresser was from Haiti. And I said to her, I said, you know, I described uh, this, this person that would appear in my mirror in my dream. And she said, oh, that's Lord Getty attempting to get a hold of you. Lord Getty is the keeper of the cemetery. And all of a sudden, this gave me um, a, 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 a form, a way to begin to um, investigate insomnia. So I'm up at night and also going into the dream state and then turning into this uh, Haitian deity. And then, of course, becoming all of these characters. That's I love doing that. I put on these women that I actually met, real women. And I spoke uh, to the audience about how they arrived at this place in HIV. And in South Africa, I 
came through the no, I came out on the audience with uh with I had a I had a a, cig, a cigar and rum to clear the space. They they rushed the stage. They wanted to be blessed with this smoke and with this rum. And I was like, I'm home. <laughs> and I'm home. And this is all making sense. Yeah. And from there, Rajni started to arrange for us to go, for Idris and I to go out to Naturina Prison for Women. And I went out and I started to uh, do this. I, I wanted to uh, uh, interview women, but they, they, they had so much, you know, South African sing. And so they did a whole presentation, a choral presentation. They had won some awards for their choral work. And, uh, and then we were out on the yard. Uh, doing, um, you know, um, uh, girlhood games. I was just trying to figure out how could I get in, and they uh, they they embraced everything that I brought to them. Well, they that's so open. Let's. Um, I want to uh, show a little bit of the video of your work in yes. South Africa, so people get a sense of it. And I hope that as people watch, you um, you'll. Um, flag a few things that Radessa has already kind of mentioned. One that she goes to incarcerated women for their knowledge and expertise. I mean, we often we dismiss women who are incarcerated as disposable, useless, uh, incompetent, just, you know, uh, crack hoes, thieves. And yeah. I'm gonna put a whole bunch of trigger warnings out there for people because this is about to be some real, real grown up talk about, um, about how we mistreat, mistreat yes. people um, on both sides of the prison door. So, but she turns to incarcerated women for their wisdom and their knowledge. And uh, they have a lot. lot. They have, they a, have lot. a lot. They have a lot. Yeah. As yeah. well yeah. as drawing upon dreams, upon mythology, and upon um, what I would call Black um, expressive cultural practices. So the storytelling, the girlhood games, the songs, the cultural dances, ones that are steeped not only in African-American culture from which, in which you emerged, which you grew up in, Right, but also the influences of the people around you. So if your hairdresser says that that's so-and-so popping up, then you incorporate that into the story. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you'll see also audience um, that in this uh, clip, there'll be excerpts of, of traditional, um, meaning customary um, uh, South, South African dance song and dance. You'll also hear contemporary clips, song, contemporary song get dance. So Kwetu is a form of like South African hip hop. You'll hear a little bit of that and, it, and on and on and on. And as you're watching folks, if you have any questions, please use the, the Q&A or the chat functions, depending on what kind of platform you want. Hello, people on Zoom. Hello, people on YouTube. Um, to send us some questions, I'll do my best to feed them into Rodessa um, as our conversation allows. But um, can we see this first clip? And as I've traveled around the world, one of my questions for young people in particular, but for many people in lockdown is, what does it mean to be alive? I'm an African-American woman that uh, knows something about incarceration because I have eight brothers. I, have, I had a brother who was at Attica when Attica fell. So I know something about incarceration with men, but I had no idea that there were so many women in jail. We live in a culture where as girls, we're very soon separated from who we really are. And we start to play the game. You start to dress a certain way. You start to speak a certain way. You start hanging out with a certain group of people, or you start hoping to be different than what you are and it separates us from ourselves, and it plays a large part in getting us in trouble. We get confused. Uh, we look for love in all the wrong places. You know, you grow up with somebody saying, oh, ba ooh, baby, you so fine, you know? Oh, baby, you so fine, carry this bag for me. Oh, baby, you so fine, cash this check for me. Oh, baby, you so fine, you do the time. You do the time, I'm gonna be waiting for you. And we do, we do it. We blindly do it. We, we, sac we sacrifice our children, our family, our own dreams.
The youth of this nation, the youth of this nation, the youth of this nation is crying. The youth of this nation, the youth of this nation, the youth of this nation is crying. Where are the jobs? Where is the money? Where is my future? The youth of this nation, the youth of this nation, the youth of this nation is dying. Where is my parents? Where is my family? Where is my childhood? The youth of this nation, the youth of this nation, the youth of this nation is dying. At the street corners, at the robots, all over the places. The youth of this nation, the youth of this nation, the youth of this nation is dying. From each other, from whites, from blacks, from their employers. I was a woman before. I was a woman before you came and took my virginity and drove me away. I was a woman before you came drunk and beating up on me. Before my children could say, we have a father. I was a woman before. Before they were cheating up on me. Before I could spend the woman's bras in your pocket. Before I could find the woman's bras in your pocket. I was a woman before. But why have you done this on me? Why have you left my life? Why are you so abusive like this? Why out of all people choose to rape my own children? I'm my own children that we engaged before. So I was a woman. Why? Why? But why? Because. And I would say, do you want to live or do you want to die? From each other. From yeah. Day. You were then took me to a dinner in one of the best hotels, drove our kids to National Park, what went wrong? So I find it hard to live without you, yet I'm heartbroken, but I do love you, I do love you unconditionally, I do have the unbreakable love, the solid love just for you honey, my sweetheart, my darling, but why have you escaped from me? Because I was a woman before, I was a driven lady, they don't depend on a man's income, but hard working and a loving mother. That's why today I stand in front of you just to seek your power and please inspire me, women of Africa. Inspire me to bring back my dignity, bring back the women's spirits, bring back the solid love that are meant to ask from us. Just inspire me because I was a woman before. Yes, standing proudly, I was a woman before, but not anymore because I am Mumakoma Kala Zimbali, Africa. I am the woman of this nation, not Animal will I play the role of being Omakoti? I am the woman. All right. Attention! Amen! Attention! Amen! Attention! Amen! 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 Attention! Amen! Attention! Amen! Attention! Amen! 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 Thank you. Yes. Um, thank you for Amen. sharing that, and that clip. We're going to pause right there. Thank you. That's a great image to land on. Um, 
So that clip included not only uh, moments from uh, mini scenes from the work in South Africa over several years, right? I think you started going in what, 2008 and then nine, yes. 12. Okay, so and it's, been a, it's been a while since you were there, but it also includes some, some clips from other work, Trinidad and Tobago or a couple um, names that I saw out there. And this image that, thank you for freezing on this one. This is um, another important part of the story. The, one of the things that distinguishes Rodessa's work is that she has been able to convince corrections officers and wardens um, in the US and around the, the globe um, to allow her to not only develop work within correctional facilities and the clips that you saw there are, were primarily performances at on the grounds of um, the Johannesburg Women's Correctional facility uh, known as Nacharena or, or Sun City. Uh, but she's also been, um, been able to convince them to allow her to take women out and to perform on the public sphere. And this is a, a picture taken by a local photographer uh, named Royal Mudal of this group of women um, performing a Zulu customary dance at the State Theater in Pretoria, which in South Africa is basically the equivalent of performing at the Kennedy Center or at the Lincoln Center in New York. So it's one yeah. of the the most prominent right state theaters that you could uh, could, could be at. So, um, and I was just wondering, Renessa, if you could talk a little bit about why it was so important for women who um, you work with to be able to perform in this kind of a setting. Why not just leave them in the jail talking to each other? Uh, what's the big deal? Well, first of all, can you can you hear me? Because I'm having some trouble with my computer. Um, they the the heart that they brought to their truth telling was astounding to me. What I'm talking about is the writing exercises, the prompts, even the one that we were just listening to. What is it that I know now, and how have you broken your own heart? African women were just amazing as far as like ready to tell the truth and to share their journey with their families. And so I call this public communion. I wasn't interested in the Negro Auxiliary Ball. I didn't want a church basement event. I wanted it to be as big as it could be. And uh, I have to give a shout out to Mike Hennessy here in California, who was the sheriff at the, uh, the, uh, uh, the San Francisco City Jail. He was county sheriff actually, but he got it, he got it. When I went to him and asked permission to bring the women outside, he understood what it was I was talking about. And he would say, well, you know, art does change lives, boom. And then uh, I started to use this term public communion because I thought it was, I wanted the, the public audiences to see these women, not as inmates, not as uh, degenerates, not as uh, throwaway women, but they were mothers, daughters, sisters, cousins. And when we started to be allowed to go into public theaters here in America, and in Africa, the families would come, the children would come. And we all understood that it was very important that our children hear the story from their mothers. Where have you been? What are, what are you doing? And it was so cleansing and purifying that it became a way. And I have to give a big shout out to the Naturina um, uh, officials, the wardens as they were called. Once they understood what I was talking about, they were just all in. There wasn't this old question of, oh, they're gonna run away or we're breaking rules. They said, fine, we will put the women on buses and we will take them to Pretoria for the International Women's Festival. They will, they will move into the women's prison there. And that was it, that was all. It was stunning to be supported in, a, in that way with, with less red tape to, um, to have to wander through or wade through to say, to say the least, yeah. Can we see the next slide, please? While well, they're working on that, uh, you mentioned a little bit about your process. So this is, folks, this is um, this is the inside of Naturina, right? Yes, this is the courtyard. Yeah, this is the courtyard. So the and there, the white and the orange are their their travel uniforms. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they are the performers. Yes, yes the performers on the my right and uh, yeah, and so and behind what people are seeing is um, well, behind that brick structure are there is the cell. Yes, Are the, the dorms, dorms. yes, yes. Yeah. yeah, and the dorms, right, right. So, and we used to rehearse in that space. Yeah, it was so wonderful. It was strange, but at the same time, I needed a studio. And this is what they could afford. 
that and, uh, and it was wonderful because the women who did not come down they still got to watch the process and every and it was everything from uh literally handstands and cartwheels because uh, I'm a very physical performer to like uh, storytelling to uh, carrying each other which in America was a problem at, at first because the women were not allowed to touch each other really and uh, in Africa with the help of my partner E.G. Sakamore we just we created all these interesting scenarios women being up and down uh, uh, creating uh, physical structures with their bodies and it was all rooted in uh, physical uh, theater, but there was, but the other side of it was that we would write. We would write. Uh, we'd write. Uh, if we had to be inside, we'd be in the kitchen if the weather was not good. But even outside, we would we would take time out and write down uh, the prompts. They would respond to the prompts that I gave them, and they were so ready. I mean, they were just so ready to uh, to write to speak. I remember the first time I went into Naturina. And I was in a classroom and I said to the students, I said to the student population, the prisoners, I said, we're going to write. We're going to write letters home to our children. We're going to write letters to our communities. We're going to write letters of forgiveness to our parents. We're going to write about what we're thinking. And one young lady said, like Papa Mandela. And they all got it. It's like they all looked at each other and thought, oh, OK. And then they start to school me about uh, uh, Nelson Mandela and his journey, his whole uh, take on being in, in prison. They started to tell me how he had to write a, with the same letter four or five times. And I was just moved that they were that engaged because in America, you know, uh, uh, the minute you, you, be, you are labeled a bad girl or you break the law, that even the uh, even the food a lot of times in the prisons is terrible. It's just like the women are like they're like just designated to hell actually, and they get fat, they get they get depressed. And uh, and I came in with the ability to actually um, say we're going to write about all of this. And there were deputies that came that were more interested in who I was, and they watched the process of getting these women to flower, making people understand we live in a very sexist world, but our country, uh, we, we, can, we, hold the, we hold the king's share of this kind of sexist, um, uh, denying uh, personhood and black women uh, who are largely incarcerated, black and brown women really get the brunt of it. We get the brunt of it. And until I, I think I came along and I wanted to engage women in conversations inside, meeting them where they were at. That it's uh, I, I can I can proudly say just to some degree I've changed the game. Now Absolutely. we're all on the outside because of COVID, so you know we can't uh -huh. be inside right now. No, no. Can we see the next slide, please? It was just uh, so this is also yeah part of the uh, performance. Um, there's Joyce doing yes. a her version her, of. Her piece about being a big butt, big butt girl, a big butt woman, you know, right. big butts, a big, big butt surprised in Africa. You <laughs> want to have a big butt, you know, you want to have a big butt. And she was fab. She was a fabulous. I'm still in touch with her. You know, she, she, uh, she is one of my Facebook friends. Yeah. That's uh, Joyce. Yeah. I was going to ask you, I mean, about, um, well, um, I think there's a question, you know, always in terms of this kind of work is, but how do you, um, how do you develop um, kind of a, an approach to doing this work? Where, where do you, what kind of resources do you draw from? Um, you know, why, why do theater with them? Would you get a sense of like what other, other options were available in Johannesburg or um, you've been working in the San Francisco system for, is it about 30 years now? Since the late eighties, I remember. Right, right. Like, what are the other? options available um, and what do you think that theater might do that those don't don't well, allow you know, I, I would begin by saying what interested me was sharing what I had already experienced with theater theater saved my life see I was a mother before I was a woman uh, luckily enough I came of age during the, the the cultural revolution in America I was a hippie you know uh, and uh, I was a reader. You know, I mean, I I uh, was reading everything from uh, actually movement-wise, Feldenkrais, 
to um, uh, Henry Miller, to Anise Nin, to um, uh, Maya Angelou, and but reading in my own time because the life was so laid back. And at the same time, I was in, I was encouraged to discuss this with other people. You know, uh, we were all talking about changing the world. Herman Hesse, uh, you know, um, which which might sound like a parade of white writers, but it was really interesting to be hanging out with white kids and they were all dealing with these books. And I mean, I, I went to the University of Rochester for a while, but school was like, uh, you know, school wasn't as interesting as my community was. But um, I felt like if I tell my story, they will tell their story. And I went in not with a lot of, uh, um, a, not, a, not with a lot of, uh, 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 decorum at first. It was just like, I wanted them to tell me what happened to you. You know, and especially, uh, I might have said earlier, I had, I had eight brothers. So I knew something about Black men being incarcerated. But I had never, until I got this call from the California Arts Council asking me to go in and teach aerobics here in California, I had no idea that there were so many women in jail. You know, one of your brothers was at Attica. In September yes, 19. my brother Richard was at Attica when it fell. Right. My brother Richard was was blown away at how um, dangerous this culture is because he had no idea what he was really up against in a culture that would just shoot you down. He saw that the the, the uh, National Guard came in and shot uh, shot the leaders of this disruption down. And he was trying to tell me, and it was blowing his mind that these people were cold-bloodedly killed. And he was this young guy who thought he could do his time. And all of a sudden, this is dangerous. It's dangerous to have a voice. And I was with a group called Inside Outside, which was, which was how I got involved in those early days with just prisons and, and Black women again who were leading these organizations. And we would go out, we were outside at that wall when, the, when these men were being, when the prison was quote, being taken back, you know, from, from, the, from these, uh, uh, these right, uh, uh, roustabouts. And my, my brother who was inside told me later and he was stunned. It was like he had looked into the eyes of the devil. And he said, you know, they just killed people, sis. They just killed people. And I think even for somebody in lockdown, it was, he had a wake up call about where he was. And then, uh, then back to Africa in a lot of ways, they were so, uh, the authorities were so open to me coming. You know, they, once I explained and, and with Rajni's help, you know, when they saw what we were doing, they were so open to doing it, to, to experimenting with, me being this American, you know, and I don't know, you probably got this too, Lisa, us meeting in Africa and working in the jail, but it was like the women would say, oh, I love her accent. <laughs> and I didn't even know I had an accent. <laughs> I didn't know. They'd say, listen, the professor has an accent, you know, and, uh, but they would all lean in. They leaned in to, to hear whatever I had to say. And they were very respectful. And I think this is back to Madiba of, of uh, um, education. You know, they were very respectful of my role inside of that place. Here in our country, women are so angry and so sullen that it takes them a minute and you have to design uh, a way for, for them to have fun or to feel, I guess, safe with you. But in Africa, they just love the idea that I was this Black American who was going to teach them. So it meant that I was a professor and they wanted to learn and they, and they listen. And even I tell you, I had a moment with apartheid in the jails where there was about four or five uh, African girls, women who were, they'd sit away from the rest of the prisoners in this, in this classroom. And I'd say, why are y'all sitting up there? And they, they were like, huh? And I'd say, why are you sitting up there away from everybody else? I said, honey, it's a new day, y'all. Come on now. And they were like, they were looking at each other like, I guess she's inviting us to come down and be with the blacks, you know, it was up. And then, but then they wanted to, and you realize that people had relationships with each other. And I just loved being a part of some social movement inside of the prisons and, and, uh, and Africa was such an eye opener because they did everything. You probably remember this too, Lisa, the peer 
you could get certification as a as an AIDS counselor, you know, uh, in, in in the prisons because they figured who better would know what this is about than the people who were living with it. Joyce was a actually a counselor for um, AIDS uh, AIDS support inside of the prisons. You know, that's that people don't don't with, with perhaps you know looking at this picture. Um, looking at what people are wearing in the context, you might think, oh my God, prison there can, can has got to be like the worst pit, pit yeah. hole in, in the world. And, and no prison is good, like period. Yeah. We got to get rid of all of them, but that's another story. Yeah. But, and, and definitely this building, you know, it, it was decrepit in many ways. It was a building that was built, what, with the 40s, 50s, 30s, and got very little upkeep from there, mm -hmm. you know, and it was definitely like, prisons everywhere, overcrowded, underfunded. Um, but what I remember being different was um, along with a sense of like failure and shame that I think incarceration just prompts in people, period. There was, however, a sense that of like, we're going to get through this together. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't meet so many people who were drug and alcohol addicts. Yeah. Or were international drug traffickers, kind of like the, the low person on the totem pool who got that caught at the airport um, mm -hmm. transporting something that they had in, in, been forced to ingest um, in a very, yes. thinking about Ellen's story, um, the, the woman who- um, Who was a mule, you know, she was, yeah, she was technically a mule, yeah. She was a mule and she, she could not refuse to take um, in as much of the, the cocaine that, that she was being forced to ingest and so uh, they they blew the whistle on her at the airport. Yeah, um, and also her her doing her participating in it had to do with uh, trying to pay her children's school fees right. after the father had gone back to, I think it was Nigeria and yeah. she had to take on the job. And it was so interesting. There was so much versus like you know, what you just said about drugs. It was more about trying to um, b build a better future for their children through uh, hopefully getting this work and being able to children to keep going to school. And we take all this for granted. Even when I travel to Jamaica and I talk to people who had to drop out of school because their families could not afford the continual school fees. And here in America, you know, it's, it's, it's getting, it's getting with, with uh, you know, uh, the, um, you know the, the schools that sort of come up with uh, the, the last administration, but in, in general, public school is still available to us, yeah. Well, let's um, take this time uh, and kind of pivot to the video, please, of your work in the U.S. so that we can, uh, I think there's a question in the chat about, you know, what are some of the differences between working in the U.S. and in South Africa? So if we could see this one, we can, uh, yeah, transition to that, that conversation. So thank you. Can you, uh, we're not getting the sound. Can you turn it up, please? I so appreciate you library folks. You're doing this on the other side of the country. With multiple oh, that's right. That's multiple right. media. So appreciate you. Mm. So, yeah, the, what's happening? We'll give you one more. You want to give it one more try? And then Friends, that sound was not working. Let's see. Um, I have another, I have another plan. Don't worry. Okay. <laughs> well, we'll let you work on the plan. We're and with you. <laughs> yeah, we're right here with you. So, um, well, uh, Rodessa, can you tell us a little bit about how you started working in the women's uh, jail in, in San Francisco? You said something about aerobics. Yes, I Yes. So I uh, was uh, I had always, I had been a CETA artist 
And I had been working in the public schools, grade schools with children as an artist. And uh, I wanted to find oh, ways to oh, include um, well, uh, Rodessa, can you tell us a little bit about how you started working in the kind of women's uh, jail in, in San Francisco? You said, oh, <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, uh, I, I, I'll, I'll say this again. I was uh, working uh, as a, um, a, an artist with grade school children, and I was constantly trying to find ways to share what they knew through the art through an artist's lens. So one of the things I did was wonderful was that I created a show and tell because there were so many different children in the mission district. I mean, Samoa, Africa, Spain, Mexico, Jerusalem, all these children were in my, uh, in my class and, and I wanted them to know each other better. I wanted them to, to know that it was wonderful that you're sitting next to this person, that person, but do you know about how that person eats? You know about that person, that person's food? How do you know about that person's dance? And I also said to them, I said, get your grandparents to come in and talk about what they were doing at your age. So I wanted to engage the grandparents and the children and, and in, the, in their basic education, they're still dealing with the familiar structures and that they're all, that they are, we are so much more alike than unalike. And it was such a hit. The, mm -hmm. the, grand, the grandparents would show up with food. They'd show up with, you know, because the children would say, you got to bring some cookies or you got to bring some fried chicken or you got to bring, you know, your favorite dish. And the, and the uh, I remember a woman from Mexico brought, uh, of course, she brought uh, uh, enchiladas and she had made homemade tortillas and, and also she had been a Mexican hat dancer. <laughs> and you know, now she's like in her 50s or something. And she had her costume on. And the children were just over the moon. And so the your really positive experiences got kind of uh, the, so the California Arts Council was watching. Yes. And they okay. said this one, we should get this one. And okay. I was a dancer with tumbleweed. I was a I was a known uh, national and internationally a dancer to some degree. So they were and uh, they uh, and the uh, they wanted to teach aerobics because that was what was popular. And they thought, well, you're a dancer, right? Well, you can come in and teach aerobics. I'm like, aerobics? And what does aerobics have to do with changing the lives of women? But I said, I'll go. You know, I tell anybody out there, you got to have adventuresome spirit. <laughs> you got to go with it. You just got to go with it. And I went uh, and the women didn't want to do aerobics, but I, I did aerobics. I did handstands. I did back bends. I did all these things as I talked about who I was. And Shall then we they, try it again? I'm ready. Oh, yeah. Are we try? Oh, okay, yeah. Okay, yes. Here we go. Let's yes, try please. it again. Let's try it again. Okay, here we go. Um, okay. I promise we're good. <laughs> we with you. We with you. Yeah. So now it disappeared again. I'm so sorry. What the heck? This is um, living proof, right? N no, it was actually your not your mother's theater company. Was that the one? Not your mother's theater company, if possible. Well, as you're working on that, I was going to say, you know, part of the reason that I think. Um, you know, the, uh, there was this urgency, um, even if, you know, your teaching aerobics was kind of a, a what uh -huh. one might not automatically think of that, right? Is because, so we're talking about the early 1980s and in yes. which this huge influx of women. Yes, uh, crack cocaine. Women were, impl um, women were arrested because they were implica impl implicated in the arrest of their men. And also, and then we, we start looking at it and there's the addictions that are growing and uh, women, are leave, women are not staying home. You know, crack cocaine keeps you up and out, you know, and, uh, and realizing that if he's gone, if he can be out here, I can be out here, you know, and everybody's forgetting about the babies. And then uh, Joanne Little had been a, a political issue that knocked the wind out of me before I was working in the jails. That the Joanne Little, uh, this African American woman who was uh, who killed her jailer, who was attempting to assault her while she was already in lockdown, and she wasn't having it. And Sweet Honey in the Rock uh, did a whole song about it, you know. And uh, uh, and and it and it, you know, Joanne Little, 
She's our sister, Joanne Little. She's our mama, Joanne Little. She's your lover. Joanne's the woman who's going to carry your child. And that, that stuck with me. It was like, you came yeah. up. Her case is in the mid 1970s. She's in Beaufort, um, North Carolina. Yeah, she's like there on charges of shoplifting, gets arrested and sentenced for like a, a ridiculous seven to 10 year bid for basically breaking into trailer homes, which she should not have done, granted. But yeah. uh, her sentence was by no means commiserate with she was a first time offender. And yeah, she's there. She mm. comes into the jail cell in the middle of the night. She's the only female prisoner, only female prisoner in the mm-hmm. county jail and with an ice pick and a plate of and a sandwiches. And she did, yeah, stab him. He died. She then escaped. She was on the lam for a couple of weeks. Um, mm-hmm. But her case becomes this cause celeb. Right. Davis is part of, and it's the early 1970s. So it's this time period. And correct me if I'm wrong, please, Rodessa. Of, 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 so we're coming out of, um, you know, civil rights and black power organizing, but also a rising, um, uh, Black feminist, white feminist, yes. feminist. And I know people can be angry about a feminist, but you're not going to take down patriarchy unless you're willing yes. to talk about, about the way that sexism and patriarchy work. And feminists were doing this work, first, second wave, whatever wave you want to call it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I and mean, we're doing this work and Black women were central. Um, and, and, and Joanne Little's case became an international cause. Uh, and yeah. she came to her aid after she was relieved on, you know, those trumped up charges about her being somehow complicit in the murder of those people also in, in, uh, in California, the, the courthouse, um, George Jackson's. Right, um, exactly. Jonathan, who tried to break him out. And so Joanne Little, yeah, definitely. I mean, she was this, this flashpoint and, um, and, and, and important from what I remember when that will recall reading um, is because she was not, you know, a, what people consider normally a, a good girl. She was not a political prisoner like Angela Davis. No. <laughs> well, hated, despised, could stand, but understood clearly that she was being prosecuted for her political beliefs and her, her activism as a Black Panther and as a as a communist, a, me, a member of the Communist Party. And here is Joanne Little, who girl, was a, everything a cat burglar. She cat was burglar. she was like she was like out there. Uh, she was out there scrapping. You wow. know, uh, she was she was uh, staying alive in a lot of ways. You know, right. and uh, at the same time, there's a boldness because we're still dealing with why don't you'd be better off if you stayed home. You know, why don't women go sit down somewhere, you know, and at the same time, then there's the idea that we should be barefoot and, and, and pregnant all the time. And here's somebody who's broke all of that down. Like, no, I'm not doing any of that. I'm not, you know, and if it means I've got to go out here and break these laws just to live, fine. And I think, I think along the way, you get so empowered, you're strong. That's how she surprised that jailer. He was not ready. <laughs> she was like, oh, no, no, this ain't happening tonight. You know, it's like, uh, and I think it really surprised them. And, it, and then we go, and then America, as Black women, sweet honey, we all move to the front and go, uh-uh. And the same thing, somewhat happened to George Floyd. It was like, wait a minute. No, 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 this is, we got to do better than this, y'all. We got to, you know. And uh, so, again, she was an eye-opener. She became a historical figure. And you're right about Aunt. Angela was, you know, Angela had a compartment to put in, you know, she wasn't necessarily loved either, but, you know, uh, uh, she was a professor. She was, you know, she was these kinds of things. And then Joanne Little, and there were several um, women that that came up, you know, behind Joanne Little uh, and uh, was just fighting for their lives, you know, fighting for their lives. And, and that's, uh, who you, that's who you meet at, at the, the county jail. I think we're gonna try the video one more time. Yeah. Hang in, hang in there, San Francisco. How's it going, Anissa? Hmm. I don't know why the sound is not working. Why? Well, we'll work without it. That's okay. Maybe we can uh, try and get to the the next clip in the Living Proof one. Yeah, let's see. If- that, maybe just, uh, um, that happens. So glitch in the system. So so you're invited to teach aerobics. <laughs> so yes. County yeah, jail. And, and I think it's just because they knew they had to do something. The, the powers that be 
knew they had to do something because the, 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 the jails were overflowing with women. And I will say one thing on behalf of our, our, our gender, our sex, is that I have worked, been in the jails and women can be so angry that they're just standing around fuming and books are falling off the wall. I mean, we have that kind of power. And I think, I don't know if anybody would ever agree, but that was happening. Hey, wait a minute, what are we gonna do? You know? And then they're eating these terrible diets and uh, uh, nobody's coming. Nobody's coming to, to get them back to their children. to Because a lot of women that I met were totally in jail because they had been implicated. I met a woman from Britain, a black woman, African English. She got locked up here in California, in San Francisco. She came here looking for a relative. Uh, a, a, a grand relative had gotten sick in England and they, there was somebody here that should know she was supposed to be bringing this person back home. And she's walking around 6th Street, South of Market, with this address, this hotel. And, uh, and the, she gets caught up in the suite. And then the, when the police finally, they bring her in and she says, I'm looking for my, I, I don't know if it was an uncle. When they're, and they start making fun of her and saying, oh, that's what we're calling it now. And they didn't give her any room to make a phone call. When I met her, she was just this bewildered person sitting in jail. And she had gotten caught up in a, you know, a streetwalker suite. You know, so, and that's how lame it was. And that's how indifferent it was. And I think also not knowing what to do, you punish people, that's what you do. But what, is, what does even punishment look like if they're in lockdown, you know, and so. In this, uh, and this is a time period in which, you know, um, I mean, some uh, people know the story of mass incarceration in terms of men, but, you know, between 1970 and um, uh, 20, that, two, the year 2010, that, that 40 year time period, the number of women behind bars actually grows at a face yes. a double the, uh, the rate of men. Um, yes. The number of women behind bars was very, very small in the early 1970s because the country just didn't believe in, in, in locking um, yes. most women up. But the ones who you saw there were would be low income black women and other women of color um, and LGBTQ folks without a doubt. And then uh, legislative changes that happen um, you know, as a result of really Nixon's, you know, failures, people's, uh, the backlash responses to the uh, successes of civil rights organizing, women's organizing, LGBTQ activism, produce the war on drugs. And so the country begins to criminalize exactly the kinds of crimes that women are most likely to commit, or I should say better, better put, uh, it, it, they begin to criminalize the things that yes. for survival. So, and, uh, yeah. And also what happened was that they found that our tolerance as women for drugs and that kind of stuff was much lower. You know, uh, you would just lose it. I mean, I, I met, started giving birth to the Medea Project grew out of a, a, a meeting a woman who had smug, smothered her baby in uh, retaliation for the father who was leaving her because now she was displaying incredible uh, sites of being a drug addict, a crack addicted addict. And he forgets that he brought the dope in in the first place. And now he just wants his kid and he wants her gone. And the ferocity that comes with just being wronged. You know, she, you know, and I'm not making excuses. It was a horrible thing to do, but, but uh, she, she smothered the baby. And there she was sitting in jail. And she would say to me, I, I, you know, I met her two or three times and she wouldn't go to the gym with me, but she would always say, I'm just waiting for God. Only God can judge me. And I was like, what has happened to this person? And that's when I found out from the, the main desk who didn't want to give me information, but I kept saying, what is going on with this woman in the back? And they finally told me what her crime had been, you know? And then of course, when we look at uh, uh, classical literature, Medea, you know, that, you know, she was wrong. It was a bit different that Jason was seeking political, uh, a political stature and, and marries a woman Af after she leaves her country, after she has betrayed her family, after Medea has betrayed her family, comes to- uh, it, 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 Right, she has all this stuff to put him on the throne, right? Yes, yes. And then he says, oh, you gotta go because you know, I, I, I found a woman that's gonna be more fitting to, to this position. That, and she said, oh, really? You know, uh, give, me, give me one night. And she, you know, we, if you don't know, Medea, uh, uh, she actually uh, kills their two, murders their two sons uh, in retaliation for how she's been wronged, you know, and uh, that matters. 
women's lives matter, people, you know, and, uh, and I will say again, it, I'm not necessarily saying it was the right thing to do, but, I, but as Chris Rock would say, I understand. You know, I, I understand. Yeah, that's part of what your, you know, your work has been is really pushing people to tell the, the truth about what they've been through. Yes, so that we understand not only how, you know, racism works, but really how racism and sexism and, and, and our patriarchy, patriarchy yeah. and anti um, and, and, and classism, you know, our, our deep seated hatred of the poor, what yes. that's people um but it looks like what it starts to look like you know and here we are you know um yeah we see a couple of the other Medea images I see maybe one of I don't know where we got to but I are some mm. so the ensemble now is a combination of of uh, currently yep. and formerly incarcerated women right yes, yes. and uh students and uh actresses uh poets um women living with HIV uh, at one point, I had several little girls. I love that younger, much younger women in the group. Uh, but it, it, because I was at that moment, I wanted it to look like the world. And we were doing a, uh, and at one point, we were working with Planned Parenthood. Planned Parenthood had approached me about doing a a, a joint a, a joint uh, venture. And it was interesting because they weren't certain that, well, the, the first woman who wanted to bring me in was working for Planned Parenthood. And I think she got asked because she wanted to work with theater for incarcerated women. And, and, and this grand organization is too worried about their own image. And they just don't think that when, because Washington was giving uh, uh, the whole Planned Parenthood a, a, a lot of problems, they didn't want to sort of merge or, or set themselves up with a group of incarcerated uh, women. And, you know, but, uh, but what they found was that the incarcerated women that I met had had just as much uh, support from Planned Parenthood, understood Planned Parenthood. And, uh, and I made a show that I, I wanted to reflect the women, you know, and this is, this is from a piece when we did in Pride of When Did Your Hands Become a Weapon? This is looking more at the, uh, women and domestic violence and, and uh, that kind of thing, where, where Planned Parenthood was the piece we did, Birthright, which was about um, uh, women and, and our rights to our bodies, to uh, our children or not, to having an abortion or not. And, and I was very moved that the women in the Medea Project, the ex-offenders, the offenders, of course, San Francisco's multicultural community was fine, but when it was women behind bars who had very positive things to say about Planned Parenthood. And of course, that was women who weren't, you know, again, you look at history and there were black women that couldn't deal because they had a whole idea that Planned Parenthood was about uh, killing babies. And they, you know, they, and they, they were very honest though. They told me that they couldn't do it, you know, because, and I, and I started to stand back and look and I thought, look at history again, look at what's happened to us in history and not having any control over it. Uh, I just want to make sure we go to the next slide. Sorry. Yeah. 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 Control. Yeah. Control. All over right. The control process. over their own bodies and their families. Their, you know, their bloodlines. That's who we are as Black women in this culture. It's like we, for so long, we had no say over, or even over our own body. You know. So um, I understood, but that was I only lost three women that way. Everybody else stayed. But this is us in rehearsal. Um, this is uh, there is a ladder. And uh, that's uh, um, Uzo, who's a wonderful uh, artist from Nigeria, who is who, who works with the Medea Project. She's also a, um, a public health nurse, which I love the mixture of dance, mysticism, and and she's very very learned in in public health. Yeah. Can we go to the next slide? Uh, so this is a little bit about what we were talking about in terms of context. Um, mm -hmm. you know, that certainly there's been progress made in terms of like decreasing the number of people in state prisons, and certainly um, you know COVID has played played a yes. significant role in that. But as people can see, the number of women behind bars has grown astronomically, um, 700 percent alone between mm. 1970 and 2010, and then you begin to see a dip. This is chart ends in 2015 because of course it takes time for the federal government to produce, um, the, to share the data with people so that they can go ahead and crunch the numbers. But 
we um, know that even, unfortunately, as the number of men has been downward trending significantly as a result of some court cases, especially in California, mm-hmm. that forced them to depopulate the jails, which were um, terribly, terribly overcrowded, that uh, despite the n- dropping numbers of the men's population, the number of women um, remains the same if it doesn't continue to grow. And that is because we have decided really in the last 40 years for the first time that we are going to punish women um, for those crimes that they, those are the yes. things they do in order to survive, so. And, um, I, and I, my, I have a frustration that lies in, I hear about you know ending mass incarceration, but I realize it doesn't have a lot to do with women's lives. It's about men's lives and I'm not opposed, but I'm always one of the people in the back of the room going, but, but you know, I work with women. I work with women and, and still there are many uh, um, portals or organizations that are baffled. You know, uh, there's a very famous uh, women's funding organization in America. They would never give me money because they keep saying, well, this is really about teenagers and this is about, you know, and I'm like, well, I work with incarcerated women and, but they would never fund anything that I proposed because they kept telling me that, well, you're, you're, you're just not the right fit. It's you so know? unfortunate because women have been the fastest growing segment of the prison population and have always consistently been a good 10%. And can you imagine just ignoring 10% of any population? The, yes. That we learn, or we, we miss an opportunity to understand how things really work if we mm-hmm. only focus on men. And yes, men are 90% and they have definitely borne the bulk of the, the violent racism and the public policies that have been put into place. But um, patriarchy and sexism and classism also work to very directly prey upon and target the most vulnerable, some of the most vulnerable mm-hmm. amongst us. And that, that includes women and girls and the ramifications from um, maternal incarceration are really devastating. There's only what, some 5 million children behind bars uh, whose parents are, are behind bars. And certainly many of those are like dads behind bars. But when a woman, and you know this story, when a woman goes to prison, I mean, that means who's taking care of the kids? Yes. Usually, the guy goes to prison. It's the whoever the is wife, baby, mama. Yes, father, exactly. And kids. and and now it's the grandparents who are getting old, and they are left. If you're lucky, your that your 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 parents or well, grandparents will take up the slack, but in, but in the long run, it's just poverty, you know, crowdedness, um, you know, uh, and everybody and also. Um, the age gap sometimes are not so great that somebody, some grandmother like, I'm going to do what? I don't think so, <laughs> you know, and the kid is left hanging out there, you know, uh, and, but also the old people are, are the elderly that, you know, I'm 73. I know I'm cute, but I'm 73. It's fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> and I love my little great grandson to the bone. And I, but I do hope that his mother and his grandmother are gonna hang in there. But if it came down to it, I could, you know, I could, I would be mad as hell at them, but I could take up the slack. Yeah. Oh, well, <laughs> somebody just said cute. super cute. Eyes. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Now there, shall we try this? Because this looks like it's got, um, a film yeah, let's with. Try this one. Is this is part of living? This proof. is a uh, living proof. Yes. This is part of your more contemporary work. Yeah, HIV examining HIV. But still, the sound. What is it? Oh my goodness! There's a, a goblin in the work somehow. There is a goblin in the system. Well. Why don't we pause the video then? Um, and uh, I hear the sound on my end. That's so weird. That is. Weird. Uh, no, it's not coming through. I've even had to put. Uh, I've had to put earphones. I had to put like uh, my earphones in because I don't hear as well as I did yesterday. Uh, with my computer. Heck. Let's try one more time. Here we go. Hey, I have a question. When you shared, did you share audio? I did, yes. So bizarre. Okay, display. While we're working on the tech, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat or the Q&A, depending on which medium you're, you're using. Um, while you guys are working on that, can I ask Rudessa? Um, um. 
So it seems like, I mean, part of your work with women in the jail led you to the work with folks who, who are HIV positive. Yes. And it seems like very much in the same way that women are ignored in the conversation about policing and incarceration, that they're also overlooked, ignored, ignored dismissed, um, trivialized in this conversation about, about HIV. Um, mm-hmm. That been what you've encountered, and so if and if it is, then what are your hopes for the the theater, the theater work, um, considering the stigmatization and the the silencing? I, uh, you know, the profile. Wait, I thought did she say something? Kept it a secret. There she is. Yes, maybe it's maybe it works. Uncle Stepto lived a fine line between life and death. I start using drugs when I was 11 years old growing up. And uh, I got into that street life. You know, I got into prostitution. Um, I started going to uh, California Youth Authority prison. And that was my life up until in my 40s. It was during one of her prison terms that Cassandra got tested for HIV. It was 1987 and she was 31 years old. Me and a couple of women that I knew and we all went up there to get tested and they came back and said it was negative and it was my turn. And I went up and they told me I had it and I started crying. I started crying because I thought it was a death sentence. For almost 15 years, Cassandra kept it to herself until she met Dr. Magdina, who began to care for her. The biggest misconception about AIDS in the minority women community is that it's exceptional, that, that it's something unusual, that a Black woman with HIV is a rarity when it's, when it's not at all. Dr. Martina is the director of the University of California, San Francisco's Positive Health Clinic, which was designed specifically for the needs of women with HIV. I went into medicine to be an HIV doctor. I went got to New York City in 1985 as a young gay kid. AIDS was exploding. In the early 80s, mysterious fatal diseases struck the gay community. They were later identified as AIDS. By the time Cassandra was diagnosed, the total number of HIV-related deaths in the U.S. had reached 20,000. I wanted to kill myself with drugs because I thought that I was going to die being HIV positive because that's all I heard back in the 80s, everybody's dying. Cassandra's turning point came seven years ago when a drug dealer threatened her life. Either I was going to get killed or I needed to do something. Not only did she need to make a change for herself, but also for her family, who she had neglected while hooked on drugs. Living out in those streets, I lost a sister out there in those streets. I got raped out there in those streets. I got beaten up out there. And it's all behind, you know, trying to get my next eye. When Cassandra told her family about her diagnosis, she faced rejection that sent her back to the streets. My sister didn't want me around her, didn't want me in the house, didn't want me around the kids, you know, and uh, I start using it again. Dr. Martina says Black women with HIV have difficulty revealing their status, putting them and their community at additional risk. If they can't come out to their families, if they can't come out to their child, if they can't be out of work, it's very hard for them to take medicines as religiously as they need to. It's very hard to go to the doctor. Um, It's very hard to protect their partners. Today, HIV is one of the top killers of Black women between the ages of 25 and 44. According to the Center for Disease Control, by the end of 2006, Black women made up 15% of all existing cases and 15% of all new diagnoses, despite being only 7% of the population. (laughs) Dr. Martino wanted his patients to be more open about their lives and found help for them outside the medical community. The biggest issue confronted in this group is how to get them to go there. 
we talked about being HIV positive. Result, fly. Actress and director Rodessa Jones is the founder of the Medea Project. For almost 20 years, she has offered theater workshops for incarcerated women. This year, she began helping Dr. Martinez's patients. The clinic is looking for any way to enhance their lives, to, to deepen their understanding of what it is to, to work to be healthy and strong and sane. We've all had a yeah. Rodessa is focusing on shame and stigma and silence in a way that I, as a doctor, can't. And the medical community tends not to be able to, or public health campaigns have trouble doing it. Rodessa teaches the women to turn their personal experiences into theatrical performances that will help ease their pain. Cassandra wants to go even further. Not only does it help me It looks like we're gonna pause there. Okay. Thank mm. you so much for getting that. And look at this powerful image. Mm. That face t-shirt, HIV is living with me. This um, is uh this is uh the the way we approach the um dancing with the clown of love, which was our first performance with the uh, in partnership with the women's HIV clinic. I wanted to uh, have women feel as protective as I can. If you're worried, we, we will do a mask as well as it becomes something else with a mask. And the clown, you know, uh, Toni Morrison, um, she, uh, she wrote a book entitled Love. And I was reading Love at, the, at this time. And Morrison had said that uh, marriage is nothing more than a long conversation. Anything else is sex is a dancing with the clown of love. You know, it's like, a, and so we, we, we found that I, I, I liked the title as well as Women had stories about uh, contacting the disease through, you know, either uh, uh, sexual commerce or through relationships with partners where nobody was taking care of themselves. And but that was like I, th I think this was opening night actually. But I think they're beautiful. The faces are wonderful. Yeah. There's a couple questions in the chat that I wanted to share with you. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, and I'm looking at the time, we have about 20 minutes or so. Oh dear, um, wow. I know it's good, it's just flown by, flown by, but um, people wanted to know, thank you for, yes, moving through the slides, thank you. We wanted to know, <laughs> um, you know, how you maintain this work on a personal level. So um, it's not easy, it's not, it's mm -hmm. physically taxing, it's emotionally, spiritually, um, hard to hold people's story, hear people's stories, um, period, but um, and, and to hear them in the kind of circumstances of the prison or the jail is hard, really hard. Mm -hmm. um, because you, I know as one who has done not nearly the work you have, but I've like, been with you in South Africa, I mean, I, I and other places, I really will never forget the, the, um, the sound, the smells, the, the sorrow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was wondering, how do you, how do you take care of yourself? Um, mm -hmm. And how do you, how have you learned to hold kind of space for others? Well, I, this question comes up all the time about self-care. And I, I had the great privilege of being on a panel with Elisa Garza about three or four years ago at Hamilton College. And um, she said, when this was at, somebody from the audience asked her, she said, I'm not so interested in self-care as I'm interested in collective care. What is that? The, uh, Lisa Garza, you know, the Black Lives Matter. And she was so, she said, she said, I want, she said, I, I would encourage a group of people that are doing this work to pay attention. There may be a leader, in this case, Rodessa Jones is the leader of the Medea Project, but I would, she said, I would, I would want people to feel like they could step up and say, Ro, maybe you ought to take a, you know, take a break. And everybody be willing to step up versus letting somebody crash and burn like Huey P. Newton. Huey P. Newton crashed and burned with the Panthers. For all, I'm sure there are reasons I do not know, but I met him and he was kind of stoned out of his mind by the time I met him. But uh, 
and that that always stayed with me. Now my heart shout is my soul shout is is that I am so blessed that I get to do this. You know, it's um I'm a migrant child. My mother and father were migrant workers. We lived in all kinds of spaces and places. And I have to admit that it was hard. It was so hard that as a young girl, black girl growing up, the way I, the, the violence that happened between men and women, I said, I don't want any part of this. Um, I don't want to be married. I don't, uh, you know, I don't want to be subjugated, you know. And, uh, and I put it somewhere inside of me. I had a baby when I was 16. It was very painful. I just said, no, no more babies. Uh, you know, I'm not going to do that. And, uh, but I do have my yoga. I do have my, um, I, I had a lot of therapy early on, not so much from this, the Medea project, but just trying to pull my, I felt, I felt so splintered in my life. And the Medea project kind of helped me pull it together. Um, like I said, I love my uh, my grand great grandson. He's just a re- and he loves me in a very a special way. And I and back to love. So many women appreciate the work that I do. That I'm showered with love for, in some of the strangest places. I was in uh, New York. This was about ten, oh, almost twenty twenty five years ago. I'm walking down the street, and this young woman runs up and she says, "Miss um, uh, Jones, Miss Jones, you don't remember me, but my mom and dad." brought me to see you at La Mama when I was in high school. I saw Big Butt Girls and they're looking at me with such, and I'm like, oh, and they said, no, 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 you don't, it was too, it was so real. You just kept it so real. And they're babies, you know, they're in their twenties now. And they're just saying, can I give you a hug? Can, you know, I hope I don't get COVID. People are still hugging me all the time, but you know, it's like, this is a blessing. This is such a blessing to answer that question. But no, I do, um, uh, I, uh, I'm glad I know what I know about, you know, working out with, I, I, I love my garden. You know, I work in my yard, you know, and I've learned to be quiet. I've learned to like take some time just to be still, you know, uh, and, and I write, you know, I write a lot. And the COVID has been interesting because I've, I've loved walking around inside my head. You know, I really like, I live alone, you know, so I, I've spent a lot of time alone walking around inside my head. I hope that answers the question. Yeah. Oh, it does. Oh, yeah. And this, in fact, I'm going to give you some love from the chat right now. And then I'm going to ask you another question. But um, we got a comment from um, Sheila James. I'm sorry. Um, she says, Radessa, I so appreciate your work. As a woman who was married to a man incarcerated in the prisons within California Department of Corrections, I visited for many years and early on knew that I wanted to do something arts related to tell the stories of thousands of families in California. But the Mm -hmm. stigma and shame of being married to an incarcerated man was paralyzing. Your work is so affirming of the experience of our humanness. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, um, well, you know, we, who can really judge us? I just left another, uh, I'm, I'm working with the La Mama International uh, um, doing a big workshop around uh, uh, the same thing, teaching uh, uh, performative, uh, 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 t- t- teaching the art of performative uh, change for, for people across the world who wanna work in prisons. You know, Right now we are doing a large project uh, here, uh, arts and social arts and corrections. The California Arts Council has uh, has has a, um, approached us, and we have taken the challenge to teach people who want to work in prisons. You know, so the Medea Project will start the the first of September, uh, I think it is, and we're going to work right through to to November, teaching folks from other. Uh, arts groups, uh, the theater uh, community, but I think also other arts uh, and social change groups that they want to come in, they want to have some tools to go in and work with incarcerated people. And so I would say, please, if you're really interested in doing it, get a hold of us. We're still gathering groups that we'll be meeting with online because that's what's happening. But back to uh, uh, Sheila's comments, what I found is like, uh, um, you know, I understand shame and sh- shame and stigma, but as I've gotten older and I've gotten the information, everything from Joanne Little to uh, you know to uh, George Floyd to all the all the places in between, and my own brother who was in lockdown, 
uh, and looking at the, the way black, black men are shot down, not to mention black women are, are falling in the streets and screaming. Who, what do we have to be ashamed of? Somebody should be apologizing to us. Amen. Somebody should be saying, I am so sorry that this has happened to you. And I'm waiting for that still. I'm waiting for that, you know. Uh, and I'm trying to hold on. God knows, <laughs> you know, I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to stand in my truths and uh, look people in the eye and, and come with some empathy. But they got to know, you know, uh, we, we're owed a lot of apologies, a lot. And we brought so much to this culture, you know, and we're still standing, you know, we weren't meant to survive, but here we is. And, and as David Chappelle would say, come get some of these nigger lessons. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I, what I appreciate is, um, you know, thank you for putting the information about how people can, can um, sign up for the workshops. Um, we only have, oop, my, my time was off. We got about five minutes or so. Um, but people, I hope you will take down this information so that you can learn um, more from Dr. Jones, more about the Medea Project's work. Please come and go and see a live performance when the opportunity arises. There really is nothing quite like it. Um, Thank you. I like it. Nothing quite like it. From seeing folks arrive to the moment, the, every moment on stage, the glimpses of the officers, you know, um, in the wings and down to the moment where people have to get shackled and back in the van. Um, the work is, is both, I think, Nina Ballone wrote about this uh, in reference to your work that we learn a lot from the Medea Project about the, the things that uh, contribute to women's incarceration, but yes. also about the performance of prison. And that is something that's supposed to be locked away. We're not supposed to know about that, right? We, we've been trusted, um, dealing with the so-called bad people. And, and, and as you said, Radessa, there are people who've done terrible things to other folks, without a doubt. And we, we People do need help in figuring out how to deal with that, that pain that was hurt, that hurt those, the wounds, the want, the mm -hmm. wrong. But mm -hmm. the solutions that we have come up with perpetuate more trauma, more pain, more suffering, which is why we're in this moment now of people. Yes. Making demands. yes. And, and I think about, I think about Brian Stevenson, you know, who says, um, you know, uh, of Just Mercy, his book and the film and, and wow. his organization in the South. He says, uh, even if someone, murder somebody they're more than a murderer absolutely if someone robs somebody they're more than a thief right. and he talked about being a little boy and being jumping into a, a pool that was he didn't know was segregated and all the white parents and their children jumped out and he says he and his sister have never forgotten it and he often wonders if those white kids who jumped out because their parents said do they do they ever think about it do, uh, probably not but again it's back to like well, you know, we better, we, we need to be uh, handled gently. We need to be honored for hanging in here. And I would at the same time say as we close, you know, uh, I really believe that politics don't work. Religion is a bit too eclectic, but art, art could be that parachute that just catches us all. I really believe that. And thank Does you, Lisa. It can be the parachute that what? That catches us all, you know, that it's, it's, it's that place. It's a basket, you know, that we can all jump in. We all got something to say. We can all got a song to sing, you know, a piece of cake that we baked, a dress that, a hat that we made, and this art, you know. And then as Africans, we are the first artists, you know. So, and I, and I found my way back to that. But thank you, Lisa, so much for, for this conversation. It's been great. And, uh, and all the, it just uh, thank you. The San Francisco Library, thank you, Sonia Tolson, uh, my administrator, thank you, Idris Akamore, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Kim, thank you, Anissa. Just thank you all so much um, for, for this um, for this afternoon, because it's been great. Thank you so much, Rodessa, for all of your work. And I encourage people to take advantage of this. This is truly a once in a lifetime opportunity for you to learn uh, from one the preeminent practitioner, teacher, of theater for incarcerated women. And I would argue um, amongst the, the most um, um, underappreciated artists working in our time. Um, a, a question we didn't get to was about, about how do you do this work, sustain yourself, but also stay safe behind bars and 
these are questions that, you know, in Radessa's 30 plus years of doing the work, she's become a master. And so and, and, and don't get it twisted. The only people I'm worried about are the guy, the people with the guns behind bars. You know, because right? they because they know you you know, ain't nobody like school them on like where where it's safe, where who you're protecting, how you're protecting. We're all human beings. And I mean, you know, when you think about the catwalks in prisons. And anything goes down, these cats are just trained, but high-powered rifles that shoot into what literally is a, a basin, you know. So I, I don't worry so much about the women, you know, or, or the prisoners. It is the people with the guns who are, they're, they're their own gang, you know. And even the ones who might mean well, they're going to go with the flow if things, if there's a, a large enough rumble in that place, yeah. Right. But one of the beautiful things that I'm sure your workshop will will cover is is kind of confronting your own you know, um, the misinformation about yes. who's behind bars, for what, and how one ought to handle oneself. Because it isn't, this isn't an easy lift to do. People need, I mean, the rest of the programming, nothing against all the people in the church, you know, who are, who are offering things. But <laughs> yeah, but uh, so much the church can do. And, you know, if it was up to the church, if we were just counting, you know, the amount of like programming provided by church, um, we should have solved this problem by now. We need yeah. to. <laughs> yes, and, and I would just like to do a shout out for uh, the Medea Project's teaching methods, this art and, and corrections. One of the things that uh, there are two ex-offenders from the company, uh, Angela and Fifi, they're going to be talking about the, uh, the uh, mishaps to, to avoid inside. They're going to be talking about how to interact with people who are in prison and and because they are prisoners they'll give you the the warnings and the flags you know as well as there's going to be a lot of navigating of emotions and taking care of yourself and so there's i got lisa and faye and uh, uh, angie and fifi and the course that they're teaching is really going to be about best practices in the jails best practices in the prisons for people who want to do it and a big shout out to black acting methods i did see that I've been using the book. I, with you and I both are. Lisa and I both were in Black Acting Methods, so that's part of what makes us so fabulous. But uh, yeah, but it's been great. It's really been great. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, Anissa. Thank you so much for. Thank you, San Francisco Public Library. Uh, uh, we got to get our sound and stuff together, but that's the next. Oh, time. We do. <laughs> I am so sorry for all of those technical issues. We apologize. But oh. to YouTube and you know all of those videos can be found on Vimeo mm -hmm. and I'll the follow up to all of our registrants where you can find this amazing information and of course you can check out these books from the library and um Rodessa Lisa you are both amazing humans just amazing <laughs> work you. amazing work thank you for being here today and library community thank you as well Natalie thank you for behind the scenes and Kim always bringing us the best of programming Thank you so much, everyone. Have a wonderful day.